This is our Sunday School lesson for April the 10th from the International Sunday School Lesson Commentary. And this is from Unit 2. It is Lesson 6, and it's entitled Shameless Faith. Our devotional reading for our lesson is from Psalms number 13. Our background scripture is Luke, the seventh chapter, verses 36 through 50. And our key verse is Luke, the seventh chapter, and the 47th verse which reads, I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. The aims for our lesson are to summarize the account of Jesus' anointing by a sinful woman, and then compare what the woman did for Jesus and what Jesus said Simon failed to do with modern expressions of devotion to Christ. Our lesson is uh, centered around the topic uh, in contrast of two types of people. One considered a saint and the other one considered a sinner. And it's based upon the contradictions as well as the stereotypical assumptions that were associated with certain behaviors and activities that set one individual, which the scripture reveals to us is a Pharisee by the name of Simon, and his activity and uh, his mannerisms uh, and behavior or conduct and how it was viewed that um, he was revered or respected as a, oh, we would say a very uh, well or wealthy individual, uh, one that was uh, well respected in his community, was looked up to as being a very uh, righteous individual. And uh, then we have the contrasting example of a woman who was viewed as being a sinner uh, and whose reputation was also surmised as uh, something that was despicable. Uh, she was uh, somewhat ashamed to herself and to those around her. And we're looking at how uh, Christ reveals his presence in the company of both of them and how he was responded to by the both of them irregardless of uh, their so-called status or their situation. As we look at the beginning of this lesson of study, starting at the 36th verse, we read that there was a Pharisee who desired that Christ would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet, sat down for the meal. Now, we have stated the uh, reputation of the Pharisee and considered to being one of the, during this time, the Pharisees held uh, a prominent position uh, while Jerusalem at this time was under the control of Rome. Rome had somewhat colonized uh, the area. And so therefore the Pharisees, they were somewhat like a liaison between the ruling government 
and uh, the people, the masses of people. So that uh, were under subjection to the Roman authorities. So the Pharisees were somewhat like a buffer group uh, who somewhat exchanged uh, uh, in place of a like mediator between the Roman authorities and then over the masses of the people. So this Pharisee, Simon, had uh, status, he had position, and he invites Christ to come and sup with him. And while Christ is there, his reputation has already preceded him. And the woman, whom is not named, but the woman finds out that Christ is going to be at Simon the Pharisee's house and uh, she brings an alabaster box with her uh, containing some very expensive uh, oil, uh, some very expensive fragrant oil and um, <clears throat> she brings it in and now, Scripture does not even say that the woman was invited to come in, uh, which says that this young lady, this woman, uh, persevered against whatever may have been possible retaliation or rebuke, recognizing that she was coming into a Pharisee's house and how they were perceived in the community as being very stout and devout and, you know, very religious uh, people and such, and uh, identifying her character. Aside of that, she chose that she was going to enter into this person's house whom probably has not always uh, responded in kind. Uh, to this lady uh, based upon how he responded, as we will see later in the text. So aside of all of this, the woman makes her way into the house and then she is overcome by her presence in the presence of Christ. And she begins to weep. And then she performs a custom, which we will entertain later. But she performs a custom that was one of humility, one of certain love and compassion for another individual. She begins to wash the feet of Christ with the tears that were pouring from her eyes over her being subdued just from being in the presence of the Lord. And she begins to wash his feet with her tears. And then she begins to anoint him with the oil that she has purchased and preserved and saved in her alabaster box. Now let's entertain how Simon reacted from the outpouring of the woman towards Christ. So it says that uh, the Pharisee, which had bidden him um, to speak, <clears throat> he spoke within himself. Now, he didn't outwardly state what he was thinking, but within himself, he begins to question what he is uh, actually seeing. And he says, this man is definitely not a prophet, because if he was a prophet, we, he would have known who and what manner of woman this is that's touching him, for she is a sinner. And in our commentary, it goes on to say that no true prophet would voluntarily allow himself to become unclean 
by letting a notorious sinful person touch him. Now, we know that among the Jews in Scripture and during this time, the, group, the Jews had uh, very strict customs about how they would even prepare to eat a meal. Uh, there would be a process of washing, washing their hands and washing the utensils and everything that were being used. Uh, certainly, they would not uh, extend this custom out to the point where they would be touched by something they considered to be unclean. But one of the things that is a contrast in this lesson is, is that Although Simon has followed the strictness of the law that they had set uh, for themselves, um, something about uh, human uh, fallacy is uh, our practice of particular customs and traditions and things uh, even uh, the practice of establishing a list of things I do and a list of things I don't do. And when we begin to attribute to ourselves uh, our own accomplishments, uh, we begin to establish a list of uh, this is uh, what I do on the regular. Uh, then we are starting to evaluate our conduct. And as a result of this, we fall into that potential and that tendency of now claiming ourselves in the light of being self-righteous. So much so that it has the tendency to cause us to look upon others whose list is not as long as ours uh, relative to the things that we have attributed to ourselves as this is what I have accomplished, the, I don't do that, uh, this I do, they do that, and that means they're unclean and they're unfit. Uh, I do this and they don't, which means that sets me apart from them and I am better than they are. And this problem is what Simon had so much so to the point that while he was, while he was willing to rebuke the interaction of the woman with Christ, he did not see that Christ had also, by him being present in the Pharisee's house, he had also met with a sinner, although the Pharisee thought that the sinner only entered when the woman came. But when Christ went into the Pharisee's house with all of his self-righteousness, he had already settled and set in the company of a sinner, but this sinner was self-righteous. Let's look at how Christ deals with his reaction to the woman to bring it clear to the forefront of his mind in a manner that he would readily understand. He tells him about those that are debtors and those that uh, lend out to people. And he talks about there is a situation of a master and there's a, a creditor and he has two people who are indebted to him. And so he talks about the amount of the debt and he, he mentions it and says that, well, uh, one of the creditors debtors uh, owed him 500 pence and the other one owed him 50. And so he begins to explain to the Simon, and he says, now, uh, which one of these, uh, if their debt was forgiven, uh, and they didn't have to pay anything back, 
uh, which one of these two would you say would love the creditor more? The one who owed 500 pence or the one who owed 50? And of course, Simon answered and said, well, I suppose the one who forgave the most. And Christ says, well, you have rightly judged. And this, when we look at really the significance of this, um, a pence is similar to a day's work. And so a worker would work uh, in a field and they would receive a day's pence. And uh, when one would owe uh, 500 days, that was almost a amount that was just like impossible to pay. Because then you have like 500 days of work that you must perform to try and reduce the debt that you owe. So if someone comes to you and you owe 500 compared to someone else who owes 50, the person who owes 50 may foresee that in the near future I'll be able to pay that debt down. And it's not going to take me a long time. In fact, I've already scheduled some days for me to address that. But the one who owes 500, just the thought of it, the heaviness of it, subdues the individual to the point where they begin to see it as though it's not even in the future. I'm not ever going to be able to reduce this debt. I'm going to constantly be indebted to the individual. I'm never going to be able to pay it off. So when Christ mentions it to Simon, Simon understands this because, as I said earlier, he is a prominent individual. He is used to uh, hearing from, counseling, talking to those, trying to rationalize certain issues involving where people are indebted to creditors. So this he is quite familiar with, and he understands that the one who owes the most will be more endeared to the creditor for the forgiveness of the debt. So first Christ tries to get him to understand, I want you to look at the weight of this. Because Simon also uh, later in the text, we will see where Christ tells the woman that your sins are forgiven thee, that Simon questions then uh, the character of who Christ is, because only God can forgive sins. But first, Christ wants him to see the weight of it and to realize just how sur insurmountable the amount of this was and how that would totally kind of just overwhelm someone when they recognized uh, the possibility that I would never be able to recover this debt. And so when uh, we go further, then Christ begins to make Simon aware of how he has neglected customs that he is quite familiar with. Now, remember, Simon has asked Christ. He invited Christ to come into his house. So when we, when we look at this, after he gives him the example of the creditor and the debtor, then he introduces him to customs that he's quite familiar with. So then he explains to him that when I came into your house, you didn't wash my feet, but the woman, she washed my feet with the tears from her eyes. Now, it was a custom during that time that those who traveled from one area to another and they were wearing sandals. And so traveling across that, that uh, region, 
and much of, much of it being a desert uh, region, they, of course, would uh, accumulate a lot of dust onto their feet. And so it was a custom. Uh, and many uh, households, um, and uh, this is still a cultural custom in many other peoples uh, throughout the world, that when you come into someone's house, you remove the shoes from your feet, even though we're not wearing sandals now, and our shoes are enclosed, so our feet are not exposed to the elements outside. But there is still a custom where people have uh, certain uh, racks and things where you come in and they'll ask you, would you remove your shoes? Because they don't want whatever you've uh, encountered and come in contact with outside to be tracked into their homes. So it was a custom of washing feet. But here now, a prominent, a well-cultured individual has invited Christ into his house, but he didn't even take the time to wash his feet. Look, I know you've traveled here and uh, you've probably uh, walked uh, uh, a long way here and I know you're uh, dusty and what have you here. Uh, come on in and let me wash your feet and let me uh, try and, and, and remove of some of the travel that you've encountered. Uh, let me try and make you comfortable in my home. So he begins to explain to Simon that while you're ready to ridicule this woman, look at how she responded to me and how you responded to me. He goes on to explain to him, not only has she washed my feet, but another custom, uh, as we'll see through several passages uh, in the scripture, That also, she also kissed Christ. Now, there was a custom, and it still is, and we refer to it as a holy kiss, and you can uh, check some of the scriptural references here for uh, Romans uh, 16 and 16, uh, 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter and the 20th verse and so forth and so on, uh, where it was just a practice of when brothers and sisters uh, in the faith would meet each other. Brothers and brothers, sisters and sisters, and brothers and sisters, that they would greet each other with a holy kiss. And just a kiss on the cheek. But here, Christ mentions that not only did she wash my feet, but she also kissed my feet. And then she also anointed my feet with the oil. So he makes known unto Simon that yeah, she did, she may have certain issues, but she has made her way and herself unto me and performed customs and performed uh, manners of sub subduing herself, of humility, of passion, and her love, and also her being overwhelmed for who she is, recognizing the sins that she has committed uh, upon herself and her involvement with others. And she now realizes that the one person who can free me from these things 
is this anointed one, the Christ. And if I can get in the company of this anointed man of God, if I can get in the company of the Savior, the Lord, he can forgive the debt that I owe. And she displays these customs and these uh, activities of honor and of love and of reverence and respect for the one who is able to cleanse her. Now, the scripture or the text today doesn't say this, but it doesn't mention that uh, since she knew where Simon's house was, it doesn't say that she came and washed Simon's feet. That she came and put oil on Simon's feet. Uh, it doesn't mention that. Uh, now we, I'm certain that since Simon uh, thought within himself that uh, this man surely would not be a prophet because he wouldn't want any unclean thing to touch him. So I'm sure she would not have been welcomed. But the point here is that she made her way to the house of an individual that she knew would rebuke her, but because of knowing that the Christ is there and the Christ can remove the debt that I owe and cleanse me of my sins. And as we conclude on our lesson, Christ says to her, that the sins are forgiven and they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgives sins also? Well, those of us that are followers and believers and faith walkers and practitioners of the teachings of Christ, we know exactly who he is. He is the son of God, the son of the living God. And for anyone else who feels overwhelmed and overburdened and feels as though they are so entrenched that uh, I can't get out of this, don't allow the uh, superimposed self-righteous positions of people in position who should seek out to reach out for those that feel lost and feel uh, disconnected. Don't allow their display of what they call righteousness keep you from receiving the blessing of true righteousness which is found in our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. So, as always, our prayer is, is that something that we've said uh, would bless you, but most importantly, that it would draw you to Christ, where true salvation can be found. God bless you, and God keep you.